Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Ben Dunoon, and you're watching Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research. Um, I'm just the other day when I was doing the news about Russia and Russia threatening uh, what their capabilities are. The Prime Minister of Russia speaking about that they have missiles. And one brother posted that they have missiles that can do, I think, Mach 5 or Mach 2 or whatever it is, twice as fast as that of the United States missiles that could actually reach the United States nuclear bombs and not be deterred. And as I begin to look at the news, then a scripture come to my mind, a scripture that was very profound indeed. It's a scripture that we often think of, and especially in light of the end times. And of course, this particular passage out of Matthew 24 is also a passage that looks back in time. It looks at the destruction of the temple, 70 AD. It actually encompasses a great deal of time. It encompasses a 2,000 year period. And then I begin to realize, where are we on this prophetic clock? This clock where his apostles ask him privately, when will the end be? And taking you to Matthew 23, excuse me, chapter 24, verse 3, he says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So they're wanting to know three questions. They're wanting answers to three questions. And Jesus answers and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, one thing I noticed very quickly in reading this, and I've read it both in the King James, which is what I'll be using as the King James, as well as in uh, the Hebrew Matthew, uh, that is one of the oldest transcripts that we have as far as originality. Uh, and they're both worded nearly the exact same. There's not very much difference, but sometimes little key things in there just kind of catch your eye. So it's something worth noting and comparing as far as the scriptures on that. Uh, but let me just show you what he says here. He says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when we look over here, This being in the, um, the fifth verse there. Because many will come in my name saying, I am the anointed, literally in Hebrew. I am the anointed. I am the Mashiach. And will deceive many. Well, in the history that we have had, because Yeshua, in this case here, is giving us a broad history here. He's going from the time uh, when the temple will be destroyed, and he's taking that history all the way up to the very end. So if there's going to be many so-called anointed ones, or those professing to be the Christ, the anointed one, and will deceive many, we have to look at what institution has produced so-called anointed ones for the last 2,000 years nearly. And no other candidate can fit that picture other than Rome. Pope Francis happens to be the 266th pontiff, and clearly, even on public news, even to this day, he is declared to be the vicar or the substitute of Christ. It is believed that he is God on earth, the very one, the anointed, if you were to say it in plain English for people. He's the anointed. He is the Christ in bodily here on this earth while Yeshua is gone. Many, Yeshua says, many false Christ will come and will deceive many. Clearly, that has been happening. In verse 7, excuse me, verse 6, he says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Remember when he says, you shall hear, he's speaking of Israel as a people at this particular point here. Although he's addressing his apostles, they represent that remnant of Jews that would come down through the time. At least that's the way I see this in, in, this, in this analogy here. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In modern times, we have had 
wars, and we've had rumors of wars. Of course, the wars have been in our timing, World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, etc. All these different types of wars that have been happening. In Israel's time, they also had the 1967 war. They had the 1948 war. Israel also fought in 1972. And there's always been rumors of wars. There's rumors of wars amongst the nations. There's always been the Cold War era where Russia and the United States would have a nuclear fallout eventually. There's the rumor that Armageddon could start at any time. Well, it will come, there's no doubt about it. But there's been a lot of rumor of wars with Israel, including when will Gog and Magog happen? Every time we see an uprising in the Middle East, we're expecting a war to break out. These are just rumors of wars, but not to say that they won't happen in their, their proper time, but at this point, a lot of them are just rumors of wars. And yet Israel has had their own wars as the world has had wars. So we have actually come to that particular fulfillment of Scripture and have passed it. Just like the Christ that shall come and deceive many, this has almost been completely fulfilled in itself as well. Now let's take a look at verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places. Now we've already been seeing the earthquakes, and we've already been seeing famines, but the pestilence we haven't really seen too much of yet. Some places in the world, yes. But I think what the Lord is speaking about when He speaks of this particular issue is what the nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom will bring as a result. Famine, why? Because just as we've seen in Venezuela with the plummeting oil prices, super long lines and rioting among people because of the food shortages. Even Russia is having super long lines because of the hyperinflation that's taking place because of the plummeting, uh, excuse me, the inflation there as a result of sanctions. Now we're at the point that nations are beginning to rise against nations. Again, it looks like we're fixing to bypass the rumors of wars. Kingdoms are rising against kingdoms. The Arabic nations are much like the kingdoms. They are provinces that are ruled by kings and monarchs. Iran is toppling Yemen, almost at the complete verge of collapse. Egypt has fallen under the United States putting pressure in there, bringing civil war about. Iran, excuse me, Iraq uh, trying to conquer Kuwait, and vice versa. All these different kingdoms are rising against kingdoms, and nations are now beginning to rise against nations. Ukraine in its own civil war with the European Union and Russia both interlocking, saying that they're not involved in the war, but yet they are. This seems to be right where we are on the prophetic time clock. We are at the time of nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And as a result, we think we've seen earthquakes, we think we've seen famines, and we think we've seen pestilence, but nothing like what's going to follow with these nations rising against nations. Let's look at it a little further, though. In verse 8, when we see these things happening, this is when Yeshua makes the comment, all these are the beginning of sorrows. This is where more than likely, maybe this is where the seven years begins at too. I can't say that that's right. We know that there's a covenant that has to be signed according to Daniel's 70th week, but clearly he says this will be the beginning of sorrows. Then he says, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Isn't that interesting? Who's going to be hated? I believe it's both Jews and Christians alike. True Christians, not those that follow the Vatican, not those that are part of the church movement that follows the Vatican, True Christians that are grafted in to the very branch, grafted into the root 
and to Christ himself, along with Israel, most of Israel not even realizing, but he's talking to the Jewish people, but he's talking to Jewish believers. So clearly it identifies both groups, both Jews and Christians, will be hunted and persecuted. That happens right after these nations rise against nations. As he said, it's the beginning of sorrows. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Right in your own ranks, right in your own churches, right in your own synagogues for Jews. You'll be hated. You'll be turning against one another. That's coming. Then he says, And many false prophets shall rise. And shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14 is really interesting, though. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. You know, for many years, and myself included, I've always believed that that is the Christian people that have taken the gospel to all the world for the last 2,000 years, and that once this gospel had reached all the world, then the end would come. And then I realized today, that's not what Yeshua was speaking about. Let me share with you what he's really speaking about. Going back to verse 14, and this gospel, in Hebrew, let me just share it with you here. It's very interesting. It's almost identically the same. He says here, and I'm just translating for you, and this gospel, this evangeli, he shows you even in the Greek, this evangeli will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations. Then the end will come. What is he speaking about here? Let me read it to you from the King James. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He sends two witnesses in Revelation 11. The two anointed ones from the book of Zechariah. The deliverers in the plural, I think that is that from, I uh, forget exactly which chapter that, or book that's from, uh, book that's from, I think that's Obadiah. These are your witnesses. It would be preached as a witness of him. Because you see, the problem is, in all of Christianity, instead of the true gospel of Jesus Christ really being preached where God could bring about judgment, see, in order for the end to come, one gospel identifying Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, to be the true Messiah, must be preached unto all the world. In three and a half years, the world is going to hear about it. Every television station, every news broadcaster will carry the excerpts of the two witnesses. And just as Yeshua brought the gospel, the good news to all of Israel, his witnesses, will set the record straight. Then there will be no excuse. Every man, woman, and child will know that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, was indeed the Messiah. When they're murdered and their dead bodies lay in the street for three and a half days, and they raise up, that is the true witness right there. Because they have preached that Jesus Christ both died, was buried, and resurrected. They preached the truth about who he really was, not who people want to think he is, not all the different denominational views of who he was, not, well, we have a Chrislam, and we have a this and that, and we have oneness and Trinitarians and twonesses and everything else. And I'm not against your doctrines at all. The point is, is we need to hear 
what the word says. It also says in the Bible that the Gentiles, 10 men of the nations, will take the hold of the skirt of one Jew and say, show us your ways, for we hear the Lord is with you. I believe the nations are taking hold of one of the witnesses, wanting to know what the truth is. Because there's so much scrupleness. There's so much questions in people's minds what really is the truth. And the only way God can be just in judging this world and stoning this world for being a prostitute to Him is to have two witnesses. So Jesus has given us clearly the sign of when the end will come. Kind of makes me think then that right there about the mid part of the 70th week of Daniel is when they do come. Or perhaps they come in the beginning. I really don't know when they come. That's always been still a mystery to me. I know different people have already got it settled in their own minds. It's just like the rapture. I have no idea. I can only tell you what I feel in my heart and what I see. But nonetheless, the time is coming. And it's soon at hand. If you don't know Yeshua as your own Savior, I beg you, make Him your Savior today. His door is open unto you now. That time will soon fade. The door will close. You have no idea when your time will be up. Don't care if you're a young man, young woman, child, or whatever. You could die tonight. Don't put it off anymore. This is the time to get your life right with Jesus Christ and know Him personally. I just encourage anyone and everyone and tell everyone that you can what Yeshua has done. We are in this time frame that Yeshua spoke about. This Matthew 24, we are on the door of the times of sorrow. We've already passed the wars and rumors of wars. That's passed. Now we're coming into nation rising against nation. And the earthquakes will definitely increase because of all these bombs going off will cause the earth to really to rattle and roll. Famines, food shortages, hunger, all these things, it's coming. You know, people may stock up on food and things like that, and I'm not against that at all. There's going to come a time where that won't even matter either. Your faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that's going to keep you going, just as it did the children of Israel in the wilderness journey. And God did that to prove them. Maybe that's what we're fixing to go through as a proving time. And don't get me wrong. I don't say that I'm not the one that doesn't teach there's not a rapture coming. I just don't know when. Truly, He does hide His people away when His wrath comes, when He comes to destroy Himself. There's no doubt about that. Anyway, I hope this in some way helps you to see a little better the time we're living in, the hour we're living in. In all that you do, we ask you to remember us in this ministry as well. Because your love and kindness... Your support is what makes it possible for us to do the things we're doing. And we believe it's in our heart to do so. And as long as we see that God supports this ministry by placing these things on your heart, then it gives us that much more of a courage to know that we're in His divine will. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. And we love you. And pray for one another more than ever because we're fixing to see some tough days ahead. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research.